Hometown Scrapbook by Ben Weatherax. Today's story, Will O' the Wisp. Hello there. We've got a couple of yarns tonight about some of Grace Harbor's old dreamers. Maybe we should call them hallucinations. Anyhow, they are bubbles that were born in men's minds, serious men too, and somehow they just didn't work out. We're all a little inclined to be like that. To, to daydream sometimes, I guess, and it's a good thing too. It would be pretty stuffy place to live in this world if we didn't have dreamers. Because after all, some of the dreamers provide us with the next step ahead. Dreamers in the world of science, medicine, and arts, they sleepwalk a bit and come up with things that the unimaginative mind would never dream of in a million years. In fact, I think between dreamers and adventurers, there's a lot of difference between them. We just have about time to corral in a few of these progressive souls who forge ahead in all generations, who pioneered the frontier and flew the first airplanes, sailed over the edge of the world to find the rest of it, and shaped the things to come. Yes, we can give thanks to the dreamers and the adventurers, in all lands and all generations. But these we're going to talk about tonight are dreamers and adventurers who lived right here among us and who almost, but not quite, turned the trick they were out to perform. We're going to credit them with a try and blame the gods for fortunes for their failure to see their project through. But before we get to wind up the philosophizing, let's have Dick Crumbie come in here with a few words from our sponsor and then tell you the stories of a Hoquiam man once set out to make ink out of the tide mud, another Hoquiam man who discovered a red paint mine, and a Grace Harbor inventor who discovered a way to make rubber out of fish heads. Oh, they're great yarns. And those of you who like to twist your necks and look backwards. But first, here's Dick with a word from our sponsor. Now these stories about projects that might have been mighty important to all of us because they were practically practical up to a certain point. And what's more important, they were feasible up to a certain point. But in each of them, something happened to prevent their fruition. So they are just bubbles. And as we look back on them, instead of what they might have been, great industries or fortunes that made their dreamer independent for life, or wonders that changed the course of an entire civilization, take Doc Matthews, for example. Doc Matthews was a chemist. Along in the early teens, he came to Grace Harbor and took an office in the post office building in Hoquiam and began to scour the country for evidence if it's mineral, if it's natural resources, and its general possibilities as a chemist. He took long walks through the hills, sampled sawdust from the mills, and had his apparatus bubbling and percolating most all of the time with his tests and experiments. He processed some reeds from the tide lens and brewed an evil concoction from roots and water growth. People who knew him wondered what he was after. But as a matter of fact, it was probable that he wasn't sure himself. He was just taking a look-see to see this part of the world and what it had to offer. And then one day in the fall of 1916, he came up with something that made news. Grace Harbor Tide Mud, the black ooze that had been sworn at, about, and over by everyone who ever got mixed up in it, that black, sticky, evil-smelling stuff was valuable. Yes, 
said the chemist. It had value as a basis for making ink. Well, that didn't excite anyone very much. Anyone who ever had dipped a stick in a black stuff or written his name or someone else's on a board knew that it could be used to write with. But it sure looked a long way from the stuff that came in bottles and was sucked into fountain pens. But the doctor didn't expect anyone to take him at his word. He was preparing to prove his theory. He made some ink from the harbor's blackest mud, several bottles of it in fact, and he passed it around for hoquiam businessmen to try. He put a bottle of it in the post office, and people unaware of what they were using noticed nothing unusual about their black ink. If someone had told them that they were writing with Gray's Harbor Tide mud, they would probably have thumped their templates at old friends at the back of their heads and that asking if there was a screw loose or something. But not knowing that the black stuff was out of the harbor, they scratched their addresses blithely and thought of nothing. People who knew a little about ink tried the stuff. They found that it flowed well, was difficult to erase, and did not fade. What more would you ask for in an ink? And Doc Matthews, plumbing the depths of his discovery, announced that there was enough mud available to provide ink for the entire world at one dollar a gallon. The cheapest ink that money could buy. The world spends two million dollars annually for ink, the doctor noted. There's no reason why Grace Harbor should not corner the, tide, the entire market. There are a few places in the world where the tide mud is as good for making ink as here. And having proven that he could make a high-quality writing ink from the tide mud, Doc Matthews launched a new research project to make printer's ink from the mud. And when it was accomplished, we will print a Grays Harbor paper with ink from our own Grays Harbor, he predicted, and rolled up his sleeves and began making ink. But something happened. Maybe the mud was the wrong kind, or the product had deficiencies, Anyhow, the great day when Grays Harbor was, the ink horn of the world never came. And if you look over the harbor on a clear day, you'll see one of the largest potential ink wells on the face of the earth, Grays Harbor itself. And our authority for the statement is the first man to make ink out of Grays Harbor mud, Dr. Irving Matthews. Well, that's one of the dreams that never came true. Anyhow, there's another. This happened almost at the same time, in the year of 1916. Jeff Havens, you all know as Jesse, he was assistant postmaster in Hoquiam and in later years served the government in the capacity in Aberdeen and Montesano. He was chief of police at one time in Hoquiam also and very active in Grace Harbor affairs. Well, Jess was out for a Sunday walk a hike through the hills of North Hopewim, and on his way back to town, he came on a streak of red color on the side of the hill that looked like a livid wound in the green hillside. It was near the banks of the Little Hopewim River where the action of the waters during freshets had cut away the earth and revealed this unusual strata. Jess was something of an amateur geologist and thought he recognized the pigment that might be suitable for paint. He poked around it, broke off some samples, and came back home. He sought out some of his friends who had some knowledge of minerals and some he knew the paint pigments. It was generally agreed that what Jess had found was a paint mineral, a valuable deposit that it would warrant developing. In the back room of a paint shop, the pigment was ground into oil and found to make pretty good quality paint. That was enough for Jess. He made a public announcement of his find and stated that he was forming a company to take an option on the land and there would be stock for sale. The bubble grew to quite a large size. The company was formed and the plans went ahead for the erection of the plant to prepare the paint mineral for market. Estimates indicated that the firm would be able to market the material for as little as 50 cents per, for, 
for as little as 50 cents a ton, ready to ship to a paint factory in Seattle. However, the associates pointed out if the paint factory could be located here, big things could be expected. It was great material for the newspaper, and they poured on the coal. They had been booming Grace Harbor for the ink horn of the world. Now they began to thump the tub for Grace Harbor as the paint pot of the universe. Well, it was another one of those dreams that never came true. The factory was never built. The red paint that was to have striped every barbershop pole on the face of the earth and tinted every farmer's barn from Grayland to Cape Cod, all of that paint was never made. And the project, as with many others, dropped into the oblivious limbo where it's forgotten, except for a few of you old timers who were there to remind us of it tonight. And these few lines in our hometown scrapbook. Now Dick Crombie, take the customary few words from our sponsors. There have been dreams here on Grace Harbor, almost without end. Great things have been projected with high hopes. And then, for some reason, the bubble has been punctured. The ink factory and the paint mine are a couple of them. But another, probably just as famous, was the automobile tires from Fishhead's promotion that was coming to Aberdeen. It was late in 1916, December to be exact, that a promoter arrived in Aberdeen and announced that the harbor would soon have a tire factory to make tires for these newfangled automobiles. What was more important, the tires were to be made by a new process that required only 30% rubber. The rest would be made up from fish refuse, primarily fish heads, which could be reduced to a usable material for tires, but a special secret process. Well, as we mentioned before, it was a time when people didn't think anything too far-fetched to be possible. The automobile had opened the public mind to the wonders that lay ahead. Hadn't that fellow McCorney talked across the Atlantic? And only a few years before, Wireless had sent a message from Hawaii to Westport. Automobile tires from fish heads? Didn't sound anywhere near as difficult to accomplish as talking by Wireless from Hawaii to Westport. So people listened to the newspaper splashes of the story across the front pages. Work on the new tire factory would start shortly after the first of the year, the inventor said. It would, when completed, produce a tire that cost less, ran farther, and was blow-out proof. Moreover, the design would make it easier to change when the motorist had to get out of his horseless carriage in the dust of some backcountry road and pull the tire from the rim in a manner of that period. He did not say how the tire would smell or what reaction the cats of the towns would have on the tires made from fish heads. And of course, stock was for sale in the adventure. But this time the promotion fell on dull ears. There was something fishy about the whole thing and this bubble didn't even grow larger in the public eye. Grace Harbor smiled at the thought of tires from fish heads, agreed that it would be a great trick if he could do it, and went right on doing what it was doing. An old timer said, I talked to said that it would be no doubt have gone over, and we might today have tires from fish head factories if that spring hadn't bought that April when Woodrow Wilson stood before a joint meeting of the White House and Senate and called for a declaration of war on Germany. And that threw everything into a new perspective. And people forgot all about automobile tires from fish heads. And it probably had a lot to do with Dr. Matthews abandoning his ink from Tide Mud and Jesse Havens forsaking his paint from the Hoquiam Hillside. For there were all other projects more important in 1960 when, as old timers recall, the weather was just right for dreaming and some of the harbor's best bubblers were blown and punctured as we record here tonight in our hometown scrapbook. Thanks for listening.